Now the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome everyone to the Thursday edition of the Three Martini Lunch along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Good, bad, crazy martinis for you as usual. And Jim, it was just a few months ago, right around the time of the government shutdown, that Republicans were arguing for a total defunding of Obamacare. And when that didn't work, they asked for just a one-year delay of the individual mandate. And that, of course, was brinksmanship, holding a gun to the head of the American people. And, of course, that was not agreed to. But now it looks like the administration is doing it by themselves, although they're just trying to do it without telling anyone, apparently, because a new rule from the Department of Health and Human Services says... If you like your plan and Obamacare has forced your plan's cancellation, you are not subject to the mandate penalty, at least until 2016. And a lot of folks are seeing this as the administration realizing there's all sorts of complexities and can't work. And they just won't admit it yet. But basically, this is another sign that this is just going to be delayed indefinitely. So that's pretty good news, even though it's because of a complete debacle. The good news is that if you don't have insurance and you don't want to pay the fine, presumably you don't feel like you've got tons of money and you don't like giving the government any more than you have to, then all you have to say is, look, I have a hardship. I cannot find an affordable plan. And there you go. Now, this obviously if you had your plan canceled. People who never bought it, I don't understand why they wouldn't be able to play the same line of like, well, I wanted to buy insurance, but I looked in the exchange and nothing was affordable, even with the subsidies. And it sounds like neither the IRS nor HHS really wants to get into the weeds and argue with somebody. Yes, it is. Even though, as we all know, President Obama said, well, look, you can afford health insurance if you gave up your cable bill and your cell bill. And, you know, that awkward moment when somebody was run up seven trillion in debt suddenly starts <laughs> lecturing you about household debt and uh, how you're spending your money. <laughs> What's intriguing about this is that yesterday, Kathleen Sebelius is talking about it, and she says, no, 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 the individual mandate is still in effect. And basically, it's in effect for the people who don't pay attention. <laughs> if you're listening to this podcast, if you're reading the Wall Street Journal, if you're reading National Review Online, then you hear about this, say, oh, this is what I have to do to get out of the individual mandate penalty. I assume what they're doing is counting on lots of people not being aware of it. So when their accountant says, well, you know, you don't have health insurance, so you got to pay $95 if you're making less than $9,500 per year or, you know, 1% of your income. And I guess I'll say, oh, OK, I guess we'll pay it, you know, and that's how the government's going to get the money to cover all the other expenditures coming out of this. Presumably, if you're kicking the can this far down the road, then come 2016, at some point, there'll be another delay. There's also kind of a backdoor admission that, hey, the Affordable Care Act isn't really that affordable. There's a reason the folks on the right are making a big deal out of this, because this is the administration kind of admitting that as written, the law is unworkable. The problem is they're trying to do this kind of on the down low and, you know, keep this kind of quiet when, in fact, you know, when you make these kinds of giant sweeping, you know, like these the fairly glaring, like the entire fight was over this. They're going to do their best to kind of say, uh, you know, we're going to change the law and hope nobody notices. So this is a it's good news, but not coming about in the way we would like, because if, you know, if the individual mandate is unworkable, it should be declared unworkable and repealed, not perpetually kick the can down the road forever. Jim, maybe the best way for him to have his highest possible approval ratings when he leaves office is to just, in late 2016, say, you know what, the whole thing, never mind. Yeah, the Emily Latella uh, <laughs> approach. <Yeah. laughs> All right, on to martini number two now. And for many days, uh, the situation in Ukraine and Crimea and the whole situation with Russia and Obama's response or lack thereof occupied the bad martini. And it's back there today for a slightly different reason. But most of the usual players are still part of this. You may remember last week, the House of Representatives overwhelmingly approved the one billion dollars that the United States was pledging to give to the Ukraine in loan guarantees. So all that was really necessary, since the president seemed to be on board with this, was approval in the U.S. Senate. Well, that doesn't appear to be happening anytime soon. Here's from The Hill. Congress will fail to approve an aid package to Ukraine before a Sunday referendum in Crimea, where voters will decide whether to break away from Kiev's government to join Vladimir Putin's Russia. While a Senate panel on Wednesday approved legislation in a bipartisan vote, aid said differences between the House and Senate will prevent Congress from completing its work before lawmakers leave Washington on Friday for a week-long recess. The difference between the House and Senate bills, there's mainly two. One is that the Senate bill wants to include IMF reforms, which, among other things, gives more power in the IMF to Russia. They also want to include $157 million in additional cuts to defense procurement. So naturally, 
Republicans and conservatives not too happy about that. So, Jim, when Republicans get accused of the poison pills, this is a good example to use in the opposite direction. This is a bad martini because of the overall bad news on the Ukraine. For those of us who are kind of wary about the IMF and kind of feel like it's big and it's wasteful and there's very little accountability and it just, you know, we dump large amounts of money into it and it uses that money to allegedly help countries have stable economies and and be more productive and and all that stuff. We're not so sure that it really does the job it's supposed to do. IMF reform separately is not such a bad idea. It's just that Democrats are getting interested in it now (laughs) in a very inconvenient time and place. Uh, and as you mentioned, you know, giving giving Russia more power over the IMF, that's not really sending the signal to Russia that we want to send. What's also intriguing about this is that at one point, it was this weekend, the you know, Rand Paul was writing that we need to punish Russia uh, and we need to help Ukraine by cutting off foreign aid to Ukraine, which a lot of people look at and say, well, it doesn't really make much sense. And, and why would you want to do that if we're trying to help this? Let me offer a really depressing thought as to why we may be a little bit hesitant about making a giant foreign aid donation or or gift or loan to the Ukrainian government right now, Greg. If we give them money, Greg, what are the odds they'll be there in a year to pay it back? <laughs> That's a very good question. I, I mean, you know, if it's, you know, as, as reported in the Morning Jolt and, of course, a whole bunch of foreign papers, allegedly anywhere from 80 to 200,000 Russian troops are all running military exercises and practicing just outside Ukraine. So... Does Russia want to invade Ukraine? We don't know that for certain, but they certainly are behaving in a rather suspicious manner. Ukraine may not need money and loans right now. They may need anti-tank weapons, and they may need sniper rifles. They may need all the kinds of things you would do for a counterinsurgency against a heavily armed force coming across your border. So economic development aid, you can't turn that into tank barriers. You can't convert that into... uh, uh, military defenses and it's you know kind of rather frightening figures coming about just how small and relatively unprepared the Ukrainian military is right now. It's not the worst thing in the world for somebody to kind of raise their hand and say, wait a minute, before we go forward with this big, you know, a giant chunk of Ukrainian aid, let's make sure it's what they really need right now, what will really help them most right now and what's in our interest as well as theirs. But it does seem like the Democrats are managing to uh, not see the forest for the trees and and just kind of gumming up the works at a really inconvenient time for those of us who are seeing increasingly ominous moves in Eastern Europe right now. All right, back to uh, Congress and the domestic side. And Sheila Jackson Lee back in the crazy martini today. A big debate on the House floor yesterday about legislation that seems pretty commonsensical. The president has to enforce the laws that exist because there's, as we've explained with the Obamacare and the first martini today, as well as some other issues, the president has a penchant for just deciding which aspects of laws he likes to enforce, DOMA, deportation, that sort of thing. Whatever he feels like enforcing, that's what he does. If he doesn't feel like enforcing it, he doesn't. So House Republicans debated and eventually passed legislation that will probably die in the Senate that will require the president to enforce the law and not pick and choose what he likes. Sheila Jackson Lee was opposed to this resolution, and here is her statement that is getting a lot of attention today. Frankly, maybe I should offer a good thanks to the distinguished members of the majority, uh, the Republicans, my chairman and others, for giving us an opportunity to have a deliberative constitutional discussion that reinforces the sanctity of this nation and how well it is that we have lasted some 400 years operating under a constitution that clearly defines what is constitutional and what is not. The Enforcement Act is not constitutional, but it gives us an opportunity to raise these issues. That's what freedom is. Okay, now for the record, the Constitution is 227, but doesn't look a day over 225, really. Jim, it's not 400 years old, but I'm not sure what's crazier, the fact that she thinks the Constitution is 400 years old or that she thinks asking the president and demanding that he enforce the laws is unconstitutional. I guess in a little bit of slight defense of Sheila Jackson Lee, the number she's citing, the margin of error is like plus or minus 150 years. So... uh... (laughs) She was among those who were strongly suggesting that the right solution for, for you know, all the economic ideas that they had that couldn't pass a Republican House and couldn't get a necessary number of votes in the Senate was that she and other members of the Congressional Black Caucus were writing up executive orders for Obama to, to sign and then put into law. You know, the Constitution, that you know, X hundred number year old uh, document she's referring to, really, you never talk about a lady's age. 
There's a fairly clear path. You know, and I even seem to remember a little animated rolled up piece of paper. I'm just a bill, just a bill on Capitol Hill, explaining how these things work. And we decided that's too hard. We can't do that anymore. It requires too much consensus, requires too much of persuading people to agree with us or to make compromises or trade-offs or things like that. So now it's decided the entire legislative branch is now superfluous. And we're just going to have them. They're really kind of the creative writing department of the White House, um, the creative legislature. They come up with stuff, send it to the president. The president signs it. Although really, as we know, considering how the auto pen has been used to sign key pieces of legislation, we can farm this out to a robot and then have the entire government run by Sheila Jackson Lee and or Skynet and just let them take care of the entire legislative process. This is nothing new coming from her, but sometimes the constitutional illiteracy amongst members of Congress is really kind of terrifying. This is getting away from our, our crazy martini and more to our you know giant existential crisis martini, Greg. Um, <laughs> I remember, you know, at a particularly depressing point, post-government shutdown, talking with a bunch of conservatives, and we said, all right, what's the one idea that we could do that could really fix America? And people threw around school choice, and they school around, you know, all kinds of different ideas, uh, tax simplification and all that stuff. But one of the, it was like constitutional education. Just teach people what the Constitution says and how government's supposed to work and the separation of powers and what the president's supposed to do and what the Congress is supposed to do and how the founders envisioned it and the idea of the Senate being the, the saucer that cools the tea, you know, that you're not supposed to pass stuff quickly and it's not supposed to be easy to, to sweep stuff around. And these things aren't supposed to be done with a pen and a phone and, you know, all that stuff with the president. That if you could get more Americans understanding that, they would have better understanding of it, better expectations of government, be more likely to hold government accountable when it goes off on these crazy un unconstitutional projects, and uh, we'd be in a better shape. Now, that's a long, hard road ahead to do, but I think when you see things like that, it's kind of necessary. When the president basically believes he can ignore laws that are passed, rewrite them as he sees fit, and there are members of Congress who will rush to the microphones to insist, yes, this is exactly the way the government is supposed to work. One guy is supposed to be able to change the laws as he sees fit, as his political needs dictate. And rant, Greg. This happens every time a liberal says something crazy like this. But, you know, if Sarah Palin had said that or... Oh, my God, yeah. yeah. It's something where she had said at a Tea Party rally, remember 1773 or something like that? And Gwen Ifill, among others, had kind of scoffed, <laughs> 1773? <laughs> Guess you don't need to go back and reread a history book, Sarah. And then, of course, she was referring to the Boston Tea Party, right. which did not occur in 1776. The idea that this just ipso facto knee-jerk reaction that Sarah Palin's a dunce and doesn't understand. That. There are plenty of dunces in politics. And if the media covered Sheila Jackson Lee the way they covered Sarah Palin, the general perception would be the Democrats were these unbelievably ignorant and uh, ill-informed and perhaps not entirely sane bunch that, you know, you wouldn't trust with a motor vehicle, much less the levers of government. And, and yeah, obviously they don't. And, you know, you can get away with saying a lot of silly and stupid things when the media is there to cover for you. That's certainly the case. But we're here to cover it. Jim, yeah. talk to you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. And be sure to join us again on Friday for the next Three Martini Lunch.